We are doing lightning talks. Is everybody ready? All right. Welcome to lightning talks. We'll go over what that means, just in case you're not familiar. But this is presented by OKC Web Devs and Tulsa Web Devs. That's because your handsome MCs are myself and Eric here. I run OKC Web Devs with, with another co-organizer. Co Eric runs Tulsa Web Devs with a co-organizer who is actually speaking today. And I think multiple co-organizers now as well. Um, so uh, OKC Web Devs and Tulsa Web Devs presents. Okay, talks are gonna be five minutes each. We're very strict on that. Um, when they go over five minutes, that's okay. You get a cowbell warning and speaker gets another one minute, but everybody knows that the cowbell has been rung. And speakers, that's okay. We want to ring the cowbell. We know it's gonna mess you up. That's the intention, honestly. Um, but just know that's the wrapping it up time and we've got a full, full set, so we are sticking to that. Uh, and yeah, I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. That's, that would have, I, I, should have, uh, I should have shown that when talking about the cowbell. But yeah, I'd like to thank Jeffrey Harden for the inspiration for this. I don't know if he's in. There we go. Yeah, everyone, claps for Jeffrey. That was <laughs> cowbell. Okay, the way this is going to work, we're breaking this up into two halves. Uh, so the whole event is two hours long from 2.30 to 4.30, but we're going to have seven talks that you might think, oh, it's 35 minutes. We're already accounting for the overage and then like transition time, so this is a full half. And then you get a 10 minute break at about 3.25 p.m. That's probably a weird time, but that just is right smack dab in the middle if you, if you slice it down the middle. And then we got seven more talks, full. We're, we're full on talks, so I'm, I'm super stoked for this. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about OKC Web does, and then as we're transitioning speakers, I'll kind of give some more pitches as to like our logo and stuff, because it's actually a pretty cool story about how we got that. But um, I run OKC Web Devs. It's we're based out of Oklahoma City. I do have a co-organizer, Stephen Vincent. Um, we meet in person every other month for a, a, like an educational meetup, and then we have a social the other um, meet the other days of the, the other months. Uh, okay, if you have your phones, take a picture of this thing. This is the important one. Um, if you are in Oklahoma Slack, if you're not in Oklahoma Slack, this is how you can invite yourself there. When you're in there, we have a channel called UG-OKC Web Devs. That stands for User Group OKC Web Devs. Uh, that's how you can hear about us and you know just know like when like you'll you'll be able to see in Slack when our events happen. The other thing you should know is that link right there, Meetup.com/OKCWebDevs. That is where you can go to uh, basically like join our group on Meetup, and then you'll get emails when we have those meetups happen, and then you can RSVP. There's a mobile app for Meetup and, and for Slack. Um, so these, these can be very easy, low barrier to entry type things. But go to these links, save them. I'm gonna transition the slide. Here's another picture you might wanna save and it's OKC Web Devs' next Meetup. It is not next Tuesday, but the one after that. We're gonna meet at Clever, which is the company that I work at. It's in Midtown OKC, which if you're, it's on 9th and Classen. So if you're kind of thinking about where we are right now, it's basically like a mile northish, a little bit west. Um, but in the Midtown area of Oklahoma City. And we're doing a thing called Tool Talks, which is very similar to Lightning Talks, which is what we're doing today, but Tool Talks is slightly different. There's no slides. They're also five minute talks. Um, we're just, it's, a, it's you know, if you're, if as a developer or a person, you have a cool tool that you like to use, we just want you to demo it, show it off, go to the website and talk about it, something like that. So very short, we're gonna have six speakers for that. Um, and that is not next Tuesday, but the one after that. That is uh, the Tuesday of Thanksgiving. So just like right before, so just keep that in mind too. We will be streaming it. So I know a handful of people here are from Tulsa or just other areas of Oklahoma. Don't worry, you don't have to come in, although we'd love to see you. But we do stream on Techlahoma's Twitch account, which is, I don't have that up here, but it's twitch.tv slash Techlahoma. Okay, that's it. Let's give a first round of applause for our first speaker, Kimberly Collins. Okay, my name is Kimberly Collins and today I'm giving a lightning talk on the topic of giving a lightning talk. Uh, you all today had the opportunity to sign up to give a lightning talk and not everyone did. And I'm assuming it's because you had a hard time deciding what you might speak on. I know that I had a hard time coming up with a topic for this talk. I'm having the same problems I had earlier. The things are not showing. So that's great. And taking all my time. Um, but I've helped a lot of people find topics for their talks and I've given several lightning talks. You can find them on Techlahoma's YouTube channel. And, yeah, my slides are just totally gone, so that's cool. Um, that's okay. Uh, so, uh, finding a topic is the hardest part for everyone. And I have a few tips on what you can do to come up with uh, some ideas. Um, some of them include engaging with the community. So, go to events and chat with people, like this one. Uh, you get to know um, topics of interest that different people are interested in. You can also engage with the community in Slack. So when you ask a question, you might get people 
um, answer your question, and that's some, some new knowledge you have that you can share with people. Um, Okay, keep your fingers crossed. Um, so here's the things I already said, I think. And so filling five minutes is easier than you might think. You might think, oh my gosh, there's no way I can think for five minutes. You totally can. It's easier than you think. Keeping it to five minutes is not as easy as you might think. I had to cut a ton of content to get this down to five minutes, and I still might get that cowbell soon, especially with this time delay. Uh, I recommend focusing on the beginning and the ending of your talk. So start with the, your first and last slides as you're putting the talk together. You're gonna start with a title slide that's gonna have your topic and your name. Then you'll have some sort of intro or vanity slide that gives us context on who you are and why we're listening to you give this talk. And that's a chance if you're looking forward to give that a subtle mention. So here's an example of mine. I am a C-sharp.net software engineer. I'm also a SQL Server database consultant. I've been doing this for 17 years now and I do have part-time avail availability for freelance work. There's that subtle mention. Um, so your last slides are gonna be the call to action. What do you want people to do after your talk? And so as you fill the content of your slides, you're going to be helping them get to that point. So what do they need to go from now to the thing that you want them to do? So as an example, a lot of people have a connect with me. So maybe you want to chat more about your topic afterwards, which I would love to. You can find me GitHub, LinkedIn, and as always, Slack. Um, spoiler alert, my call to action is for you to sign up to give a talk. You have several opportunities to do that. Uh, the design tech group, web devs, as mentioned, Pythonistas, if you're a woman or non-binary, we'd love for you to speak at She Codes OKC. And then uh, a year from now, speak at Thunder Plains. If nothing else, you can speak at the Coffee and Code Group. That will uh, make that work. So like I said, finding a topic is the hardest part for everyone. And this is the thing I already said. And I would recommend focusing more on the why than the how. And so if you're only speaking for five minutes, you don't really need to get into the technical details of the thing that you're sharing about. Uh, you just uh, convince the audience to learn more about it if they're interested. And so I'm not really following my own rules here, but go look up this talk from Carmen on Techlahoma's YouTube channel, Why You Should Give a Lightning Talk. And then also watching other people's talks gives you kind of some ideas of other things, maybe related, that you could speak about. You can share something that's new in the world or just new to you. If you just learned it, you're probably excited about it and can share your new knowledge. It's okay to assume that the audience knows a little bit less than they probably do. It's okay to over-explain a little bit. And it's totally fine if you talk about something that the audience already knows. Developers love to feel like they know things, so it's totally fine to do that. When you give your talk, other people will also be speaking, and so it's fine if your topic only applies to some of the audience. Don't feel like your topic needs to be 100% relevant to everyone, but as long as you're speaking to some percentage of the group, that'll be great. You can tell a story, so a story of how you solved a problem, something interesting that happened to you in your tech journey. Um, you can tell your own story, so how you got into tech, how you got into your role, how you got into your tech stack. This is something that anyone can do. And when you're giving your own story, nobody can well actually you. Uh, so one last tip is to talk to the leaders of your favorite user groups. They probably need speakers for their meetups. So ask them to chat through some different topic ideas and they'd probably be happy to do that. If you're not quite ready to give that first talk, talk to them about being on a panel where there's a, like questions being asked and you just answer if you can. So no stress, prepare a talk. If you're not quite ready for that either, uh, there's usually a time for announcements to be read. Someone's gonna have to do that. It might as well be you, as so you can stay up in front of the group and feel more comfortable speaking. And then one other thing that gets you feeling more comfortable is to volunteer to help out with meetups. That gives you kind of a feel for the logistics of you know, the AV issues that always happen, and that'll maybe just get you more ready to give that first talk. So if you still think there's nothing you can speak on, uh, I'm up to the challenge of helping you find something. Let's chat about it. If you're able to find my Calendly link, that means I am offering you 30 minutes of my time to chat, I'm certain that we can find something for everyone in this room to speak on. So as promised, here's my Connect With Me slide. Slack is definitely the best way to find me. And so again, here are the different pl places you could give a talk soon. So thanks, Slack is, the, again, the place to chat with me. I wanna give a few shout outs. Uh, Aaron and Eric for giving the, uh, putting this together. You can speak at their groups. Um, Aaron made the slide and also saved the slides working for me. Uh, Eric's help with the mentor uh, program, Adrian with Design Tech, Lance, Shanda, Hannah, Hannah, and Layla. Everyone who's giving Lightning Talks today, shout out to you, and everyone who's signing up to give a talk, which I hope is you. Shout out to Kimberly, that was awesome. We've got Cam Pack coming up next. Cam, you can go ahead and get yourself set up. 
I did not prepare really interesting Techlahoma tidbits or OKC Web Devs logo backstories for you. I instead went down the interesting and random facts that I found fun on the internet hole, most of which are related to today. So uh, we'll start with a slightly more serious one. Today is Veterans Day Observed, if you didn't know that. So uh, thank you to any veterans in the room and the building for your service. Also on today in history, the United States Marine Corps was founded in 1775 when the Continental Congress raised two battalions for the American Revolution. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Cam here, so I'll get ready for that. Sweet. Well, uh, I'm Cam Pack. I didn't have a fancy presentation, but we're going to look at some cool stuff. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am a product designer by trade now. Uh, I came from Devlandia. So I did uh, dev work for about three or four years in the game. And then I care about the users a lot. I've seen bad designs. Something in me just switched and I um, kind of had to go that direction. But web dev is just super fun for me. Um, let's see. Uh, I play the keys so I can write the codes. Um, let's dig in there. Who knows about jQuery? A few, everyone, a lot. Who knows about HTMX? I, I'm not going to be sharing HTMX. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to be sharing something uh, called Alpine JS. It is created by the creator of Livewire. Um, he uses it to add interactivity to a page without having to do a lot of work. Um, Sometimes you have a React website that you built, and it probably didn't need to use that whole framework. You probably put a lot of work, and there's, there's other ways where you can add that sort of interactivity. What am I talking about? Let's dig in. So uh, for you folks, you can go to Alpine. I think it's, yeah, it's alpinejs.dev. Uh, don't go to it now. You, you go to it after. Um, and it's just super simple. They call it the next jQuery. A lot of your work in state management, everything is handled actually inside of like DOM attributes. What is that? I'll show you later. But it's just dead, dead, dead simple. You throw in a script, no bundling, no like build step or anything. Um, throw in the script tag, and then you reference things in a different way. So you, you preface it with like x dash this. x dash data is the beginning of your state. It is a JavaScript object. And if you think about objects, and if you know about objects, you can do a lot of really cool things. Um, so this is just a simple example. Opens it and says, open is false. It's a Boolean. And what you can do is, there's different ways to say this, but you can say x dash on click. And then you can say open equals true. Um, and then we'll see an example of what this is, looks like in React versus in Alpine land. And then to show this, instead of saying like, if this exists, then show this or show null, just say x show open. So it's, who, who has seen Alpine or heard of Alpine? A few folks, great, 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 great. So I've been using it for fun on personal projects. I just made a simple demo, there's two demos. Um, one is a button that increments and then we can reset it. And then another fun one about list items and adding to-dos. So here's just a simple button click add, add, add. What does that look and feel like in React? Well, you have to go and make sure that you can set your state. So we set count, uh, we get count, we set count, make it zero. Um, we have a button, you click it, set the count to this, and then we can reset. And right now I have 20 lines of code. When I look at um, this Alpine component, it is, I initialize data here, I say when I click, you just add one to it, and then when I click reset, it's gonna set it to zero. So this is half the amount of code to get this running, and they both do the same thing. Okay, let's go to the second example, forward slash poop. Okay. Um, this is like a little input, it just creates this uh, list of just random stuff. So if I say hello, it'll add it. If I say hello, it'll add it. Alpine has some really cool stuff. I don't know if you caught that. I added it and it has this really cool animation at first. Um, but let's look at the code and the differences and you'll probably be surprised. So we'll look at the React version first. I had to set the input, I had to set the to-dos, and then you have to do a few things to change it and say, okay, 
well, this is what the search term is. This is what I'm gonna add to it. And then this is what happens when I press enter. So you have to do a lot of JavaScript-y stuff and eventually I'm mapping it. I'm not getting too nitty gritty in this because I just want to show you the main thing is you can kind of cut your code in half and not have to use like a compile step or something. Um, you just throw it on a page. You don't have to use React. React is good, but you don't have to use it for some things. Um, and then here I'm just getting it. We're at 41 lines of code. So then I'm, now we're at the Alpine component and I set the data up front. I just, it's an object. You can say, okay, one minute. It is an object. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, you have your to-dos and then a function to add the to-dos. To reference things, this is a cool JavaScript thing if you didn't know about objects. To reference a piece of object, like a property, just say this dot property. And you actually have access to that property inside the same object. But if you just get a glance inside of this, you can do for loops for components inside Alpine. It's really cool. Um, and then you can add things like X transition, which makes it when it shows, it animates in. And then we're at 25 lines of code instead of 40. And I stayed inside of the, I stayed inside of the DOM the whole time. I didn't get in JavaScript function land too much. You can do a lot with Alpine. Um, if you're doing something, creating like a static site that needs a little bit of activity, you should check out Alpine. Um, last thing. <laughs> Connect with me. All right. I'm, Thank I'm, you. I'm very happy with our cowboy usage so far. That, that was awesome. Um, so next up, I have Stephanie Leeser uh, give an awesome talk over Power Tools, a quick look at PoshGit. PoshGit. Um, yeah, raise the roof for Stephanie, everybody. While she's getting set up, I'll mention, um, uh, Cam mentioned that Alpine.js is created by the guy, person who made Livewire. That's uh, a tool that is kind of in the Laravel ecosystem. We use it at Clever. Um, we we do a lot of Laravel, so it's it's pretty awesome. Um, as far as fun fact, before Stephanie gets set up, um, oh, Techlahoma was actually is currently headquartered in Tulsa, up at uh, 36 degrees north. It was originally headquartered in OKC at Starspace 46, which is a co-working space. During the pandemic, that shifted, and that is it for the fun fact. Stephanie, you are up. Hi, let me fix my talk. Five minutes. I gotta go fast too. My name is Stephanie Leeser, and I'm here today to give you a quick talk about Power Tools, a quick look at PoshKit. Five minutes, can't really get into a ton of stuff, right? So I thought I would just guys give you guys a rundown of a tool I like to use and I take advantage of every day at work. Um, and I did kind of follow Kimberly's method on Lightning Talk. Here's my second slide. Introduce, introduction about me. Um, I'm an application developer, too, at Love Travel Stops. I've been there like nine years, two as a full stack developer, three in learning and development roles, so I like teaching people stuff. I do love Angular, thanks to the endless projects at work. And I've been to ng-conf twice, and I was the honorary sponsor of this year's event. It was really fun. And I also love DIY projects and riding bikes. So to get into it, what is PoshKit? Um, well, the website says it's a PowerShell module, which provides Git and PowerShell integration. Uh, you can download it at this lovely link, or the Bash version if you like to use that. Um, just Google it. And um, it was created by a guy named Keith Dalby. Got to give him some credit for that. Um, so into the real stuff. Um, PoshGit provides terminal status information for your Git repository. So if you're like me, you like to use a command line, you deal with a lot of repos, pulling other people's code, making changes, seeing if things work. You got a lot of stuff going on. So for me, PoshGit gives me a lot of information just right there on the command line where I'm at. Um, you can see here when you first open, um, open a folder that has a Git repository in it, it'll tell you what branch name it is. And you'll see the three equals means that your local and your remote repository are at the same commit level. So we're even Steven right now. But as you start making changes and doing work, PoshGit will keep up with you and kind of let you know. So as changes are made in the repository, those changes are reflected in the prompt. Um, and you can see here I've well, you can't because I made the slides red and it's hard to see, but <laughs> um, I've deleted a file, I've modified a file, and I've got an extra file just hanging out there that I, I haven't really talked my team into getting ignored yet, so I need to, I need to remember to do that. Um, but yeah, so it gives you a plus sign for the untracked, a little um, tilde for the modified, and a minus for the delete, and you can see that exclamation mark there, so just let you know, you've got stuff that, um, 
that is not being saved. Um, so as you save your files, uh, the prompt will go ahead and reflect those changes for you. So I've got the two files there. I'm sure I want to delete that one file. And um, I staged that file that I modified. And I still got my settings hanging to the side because I don't want to commit that part. So the command line updates to where I'm at. You can see now I'm on my posh git um, branch name. And I've got one file modified, one file um, deleted. And then on the right side, it still says I have that one file hanging out. Now as you commit these files, um, Poshkit will update for you there as well. You can see how my branch name turned green now, and it's telling me I have an up arrow. Uh, so that tells me I'm one commit ahead of my remote branch. Um, and as I add other files, you can see I finally added that extra file hanging out there and committed it. Um, now it says I am two commits ahead of my remote branch. So to me, that's just easy to, as I'm bouncing back and forth between my repositories. So I kind of have a quick visual of what's going on. Um, and the same thing, if your remote changes occur, your branch name will turn red and it'll give you a down arrow letting you know, hey, there's some stuff you need to pull down, there's some changes. So to me, it's just a great indicator so I don't have to you know, get status and, and look at stuff all the time. And sometimes this one happens, and I hate when this one happens. That means you've got commits behind and ahead of your remote branch. So you're gonna have to do some work to get those cleaned out, but it does just gives you a clean indicator of what it's like. Um, and it also makes mer con merge conflicts seem a little less scary. Here it kind of even gives me the status as I'm in the middle of a merge conflict. Uh, my package.json, I, I messed it up on purpose just so I could get this example. Um, but you can tell it's I'm in the middle of a merge. Um, I've got one up and I've got one conflicted file there that I need to handle. So as you get those handled, it, um, it'll go back and let you know you've got one to push up. And oh, I'm good on time. And the coolest part for me is personalization. Uh, this is really hard to read. Uh, but what you can do is um, the software gives you this object called git prompt settings. And you can go in there and if you just type dollar git prompt settings, it'll load your um, command line with everything that you can change. You can change the color, what the ups and downs mean. You can even add time stamps um, and remove the directory from the thing so you have a shorter prompt in general. It just gives you a lot of power to do a little things that you want to kind of see in, in your terminal exactly where you're at. Uh, sweet, I've got like a minute left and I made it on time. So here's my last slide, um, connect with me. I am S.A. Leaser on all the popular social media. So if you guys wanna chat or talk to me, give me a shout. Thank you guys for having me. No cowbell, he was ready. Ah, oh, sweet. <laughs> Okay, up next we've got my co-organizer for Tulsa Web Dev, Alec Helmsburn. Alec, oh, back there. Alec, you're up. Go ahead and let's get yourself set up. I can grab myself a mic. Well, Alec's bringing himself to the stage. As I mentioned, he's our, uh, my co-organizer for Tulsa Web Dev. It's been real fun working with him all year on that. Today, in 1969, friends, Sesame Street debuted. So today's presentation is brought to you by the letter C for cowbell and the number five for the minutes before you will hear it. How are you doing, Alec? Doing good, and you? Good. good. I'm going to steal the mic from you because I can't just... Oh, you're going to wander? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, got, you got that on 15 feet of cable. Cool. That does not cool. prevent me from cowbelling you off the stage. So. I understand. You, you, have, there you, go. you have all the power here. All right, so a uh, quick question. Uh, so I'm, I'm weird about like raising my hand in a crowd, so I'm gonna actually start with everybody. Can you raise your hand for me just like as high as you can? I wanna like reach for the sky, perfect, okay. So if you do not, oh, no, no, keep it up, keep it up. Keep it up, yep, oh, yeah, I'm gonna make your arms tired. Okay, so if you uh, work on or around a JavaScript base, uh, JavaScript code base, put your hand down. Okay, a lot of JavaScript folks. Okay, um, for those of you who have your hands up, do you do anything with TypeScript? No, type, okay, so, so go ahead and raise your hand again if you do work with TypeScript. Okay, so maybe, maybe about half, maybe about uh, a third of our, our folks here that are JavaScript devs, uh, also TypeScript devs. So raise your hand if you are a TypeScript dev on a mostly JavaScript team, and you're just like, you're the one that's, yeah, there you go, you're, you're kind of singing the praises all the time, yeah, okay, okay. Um, and who has one of those people on their team? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, but do I need to have everybody with a raise hand again? Because, yeah. Um, well, what I'm gonna talk about today is, uh, well, TS for the JS of us. 
Um, I'm a big TypeScript advocate, so a lot of uh, folks that know me are probably gonna expect me to sing the praises about TypeScript. I'm actually gonna not do that today. I'm gonna talk about some of the benefits you get, uh, but how you can get those without all the headache. Um, so if we look at the file I have up on the screen now, I'm gonna actually make that a little bigger. Okay. Cool beats. Yeah. And I can get rid of this guy if I know how to use my stuff at this size. Okay, cool. One more? Cool. That, how's that look? Sweet. All right. So, uh, can anybody tell me what, well, what this does? Right? Just by looking at it, uh, I mean, it gets uh, an arrow index. Um, what does it want from me? It wants to know a number of rows. I can probably guess that's like a number, right? Uh, is auto suggestion picker large? It's probably a yes or no question. So I can uh, I can infer that's a boolean. Um, I mean, this is this is kind of intuitive and somewhat easy to understand. If I were to go and say, maybe have to convert this code base to TypeScript, uh, well, it'd be not too hard. I change the name of the file to a .ts, uh, and I'd go here and just kind of annotate those things that that I was looking at. So okay, yeah, I would say this is a number, and the next one uh, we have a boolean, so forth. Uh, TypeScript's actually smart enough to infer, uh, even in a JavaScript file, if you're using like VS Code, this is all built in. Uh, if you can see here, it says number, because it knows that down here you have returned a number, because you subtracted a number, it's smart enough to figure that out for you. So, uh, well, step one's already done for you. Most of your uh, JavaScript already has types, just because TypeScript's uh, built into some stuff now. Well, what about a file a little bit like, uh, like this one? Nope, that's the right one. That's uh, much longer, and uh, it's got a lot of imports. So if I were to turn this into a TypeScript file right now, it'd get really mad at me because it's gonna have a lot of annies and a lot of things that it does not recognize being imported. Oh, it didn't get as mad as I thought it might, but it did get mad, so we'll, we'll kind of take a look at that. Um, now, now, terrible example. Here we go, this is a good one. I like this one better. Uh, yeah. So converting this into TypeScript, you might think, oh man, that's, that's using a lot of stuff. I'm gonna have to go through and I'm gonna have to convert everything this uses to TypeScript. It's gonna be a long time before we get there. Um, but that kind of sucks, right? So like someone like me who really loves TypeScript, uh, I'm gonna struggle because I'm gonna see, I don't know what the type of this is. I've gotta go research it. I've gotta look it up somewhere in the code base. I've gotta follow that symbol all the way around. Sometimes I have to go straight into the documentation uh, just to figure out what this item is. I'm like, what can it do? What properties does it have? I don't know. Uh, and when I figure all of that out, the next time someone touches it, they have to do the same thing. It's, uh, it's almost as time consuming as having to convert everything to TypeScript, right? So what do you do? You just, you can't get the best of both worlds, uh, but you kind of can. And I'm gonna actually trade off microphones for a moment because now I'm gonna need to type. And uh, the, Approach here we're talking about, so some of you may have seen the comments uh, in your code annotating your functions, uh, and you get these lovely little types, uh, type hints, these little tool tips that tell you about what you're looking at, except this one doesn't say much. It just says that could be anything. Well, uh, yeah, good luck. Uh, that's gonna drive me nuts as a TypeScript developer, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna struggle. Okay, so what can I do about it? I can actually insert my types in a comment uh, up here in JS Talk. It takes everything that TypeScript does, and at the end of the day, once I've done my research and figured out, okay, I know what all of these properties are, uh, as long as I tell it, you know, we know this is an object, it's got some properties, uh, we're gonna say is using memory only, we know that's a Boolean, so forth. As we go through and as we add these comments, we're gonna get all of that wonderful hinting across our code base, and it's not gonna break anything. Right, we're just one function at a time in a huge file incrementally so that the next time your dev has to go and look up the types and the information for that interface can be the last time anyone on your team has to uh, without all the headache of converting to TypeScript. So. At least, at <laughs> All right, this is, this is much more fun than I think anyone probably thinks it is, like being so strict like this. Okay. 
All right, we are halfway through the first half, quarter of the way through. Um, okay, next up, we're going to have Gopar Daniel talking about content security policy. So come on up, Gopar. Do we have a Gopar in here? Yep, there we go. Okay, so while he's getting all set up, as I and Eric mentioned, we're going to give some fun facts about the OKC Web Devs logo. I know you can't see it right now, but there's some stickers at our booth, and you might have seen the logo. But it's pretty colorful, and it has these boxes and everything. There's, there's a lot of different things involved in that, and I kind of want to just randomly, not all at once, but talk about it. But the first thing I will mention is that there's various colors on it. There's various shades of gray. There's an orange. There's a green. There's a blue. And they're not just random colors. Uh, they're actually the same branding colors that of Oklahoma, like the little state of Oklahoma. If you go to oklahoma.gov's website, they use the same state branded colors there. So that's kind of where we got the inspiration for that. Uh, so many more fun facts to come. Let's raise the roof for Gopar. Hey, I'm Gopar. I'm going to be talking about content security policy. I'm just curious, how many people know what a CSP is? OK, so there might, well, I'm sorry for some of you. You, you won't learn anything about that. Uh, all right. Let's see, uh, let's go ahead and start. So I'm Gopar, I like learning about web security. I worked at a startup, security startup for a few years, so I learned some stuff there, and I own a dev agency. So, all right, enough of that. So what are the current threats? So some of the current threats that we have is that we have cross-site uh, scripting. What cross-site scripting is essentially, it allows anybody to inject JavaScript into your website. So if you can think of some things that they can do, that's pretty much bad. They can steal sessions, they can steal data, they can do whatever they want if they can inject JavaScript. So that is pretty bad. So how do you want to mitigate that? So how do we defend what you have? So this is where CSP enters. CSP allows you to block uh, or tell the browser to not load any resources or any places that you don't want it to load. So this will defend against uh, inline scripting or those types of cross scripting attacks. So it is pretty much uh, handled by the browser. So you just need to t give it the rules and the browser will take care of it. So you don't have to worry too much about it. So how does it work? Well, I guess I can just kind of set it. So you set the rules in the HTTP header, so you configure your server or your web framework to return those headers that you want and with the rules along with it. And from there, the browser takes care of it. You don't have to mess that much with your code. So that's pretty nice. So this is how uh, the CSP looks. So we have right here a content security, so this is the header, and we're just gonna focus on this part. So this says, this is the directive, it says, hey, for all scripts, just load the self from, self just means origin, so from whatever domain you're working on, and I want you to only load from this third party uh, uh, domain as well. So only load scripts from your own domain and trusted uh, external API. So that's how you can limit. So that way if somebody accesses your web page, they can't just drop their own script tag and say, hey, load from evil.com, that site, or whatever. So directives are, you know, tells the browser what type of uh, resource do you want to load, just the script, images, fonts, all of whatever, whatever you can think of, if there's a directive for it. And the source just tells it where it can be loaded. So for example, like I mentioned, this, was, this is directive, and this is the source. All right, so we do have some directives already, like I mentioned. So we have script style images, and you can go ahead and look up some more, but those are pretty much uh, the ones that are more relevant right now, or at least then I decided to put on the slide. But yeah, so sources explain. So in the example that I showed self, as I mentioned, only loads from the origin. You have none, so it says, hey, don't even try to load this. Don't even, tells the browser, don't even load. Like if you put a none for images, it won't load anything. Uh, it says HTTP, so only for that domain, HTTP, but from any domain. And we also allow data URIs. So if you're saying, hey, all right, this sounds awesome, but I have to do inline scripting or I have to do inline tags for whatever reason, there is a way to allow that, and that's with nonsense and hashes. Essentially, uh, well, yeah, I won't get too much into detail, but there is a way to support it if you guys need it. And it, is not, isn't, it isn't that hard to add, so you can, yeah, you guys are smart, you guys are here, you guys can read documentation, so you guys can, pretty sure you guys can figure it out. So what are the best practices? So, you can start with a strict uh, CSP policy if you like, and just uh, one thing to note is that if you start with a strict policy and you don't put it to reporting mode, it will break your site. So you need to add, put it in reporting. That way it sends you the reports of all the violations that are happening, and it is basically on dev mode. So it just tells you what, what are the errors so you're not breaking it, and then you can fix your CSP as you go, and that way it makes, it, it makes your site more secure, and you don't break anything, and your users are not angry, and you don't have a backlog of customer support tickets that you have to deal with, because you decided to add this. Yeah, so yeah, that's one way. Um, 
So yeah, adding CSP protects you from cross-site scripting, but it is not the only solution. You have to use it with a variety of other techniques within the security realm. It does give you some, uh, like I mentioned, it does protect you from uh, cross-site scripting. Um, yeah, but uh, it gives you more control over external resources, but that's pretty much it. I think I blew past it, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, this is where you clap. <laughs> I was just joking, thank you. Two of us have deprived of us of cowbell joy here. I'm not sure how I feel about all of that. All right, uh, so yeah, great, go far. Up next, we've got Brent Shambau uh, talking to us, I think, about Web3 stuff, it looks like. So Brent, if you want to go ahead, we got a Brent in here to get set up. Brent? Are we missing a Brent? If he's right outside, grab him, because we have a minute in the transition here. Well, well, Hannah's checking for Brent. Your next random factoid, which I found really just lovely and beautiful, is uh, that the official, officially named color of the universe, if you didn't know this, is Cosmic Latte. So there was actually uh, the uh, astrologers at, as you will, uh, took, uh, took a, sorry, and astronomers took a moment and uh, did the math and averaged essentially all the wavelengths emitted across the universe. And they average out to a lovely color that is slightly off-white beige-ish, which has been officially named by said scientists as Cosmic Latte. Stage is yours, Brent. You can come up here however you'd like. Yep, podium's up there. Mic for you, sir. All right, so we'll hand it off to Brent here. Brent, once you start, we'll start your five minutes and your cowbell is Oh, uh, one more minute. So you're starting the clock? We'll start the clock when you start. That's when you're about ready here. All right, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I got my notes, I think. Uh, cool. Does this work? Nice. Um, so we're, we're ready to roll. Okay, so hi, I'm Brent Shambaugh. You might know me on Discord as B Shambaugh. So I won't spell it too long, but yeah. Um, so, here to kind of talk about what I did this summer, and basically what I did this decade. So because they're kind of a reflection of one another in that a decade ago I started a journey, and this year I was revisiting the reason why I got started on the journey. Um, so it was a process of trying to reach self-actualization in a lean manner by realizing that a lot of opportunities, um, well, kind of how, the, uh, how my brain worked was I take a bunch of ideas and I have different things related to other things and they remind me of things beyond that and that eventually I start building a knowledge graph or kind of a directed graph that might be uh, kind of in a distributed space described with uh, semantic web. Um, well, I discovered that later. Um, but anyways, um, so uh, this led to a knowledge management group at, well, I guess the first Hacker space, maker space. So there was a guy named Dylan Mackey who started this space called Ohm Space. And I had a knowledge management group before that because I was exploring how to model my knowledge and try to um, interface that with other people's knowledge because I, I was looking for a way that um, I'd be able to work on projects. Um, that I guess we're open source, maybe open source hardware, but I didn't necessarily want to have to go through the traditional um, educational system. I thought that it was too rigid um, and expensive, not to, not to mean the thing. So naturally this led to a uh, distributed space. And so I tried to map that to what I discovered was a maker space, kind of hacker space. And So this, this, this led to not only modeling the data, but also looking at how to make this data discoverable. Um, 
So th that's like twofold. First, you have to do that on the computer side. You have to account for different semantic and data structures with that. You also have to keep the data where it's most used. So you have to um, do a lot of protocol things on the background, but you also have to think about presentation on the front. Um, there's a lot of different ways to look at directed graphs. Um, some of them can kind of get kind of noisy and they're also difficult to enter. So you kind of maybe abstract towards natural language query. And interestingly, you have to get the data in there, which, oh, kind of cool with kind of all the buzz with AI, there might be a way to revisit that in some ways. Um, so I've been across the continent this year, all the way from Nova Scotia to Los Angeles. Um, so I, I guess it started out in Denver, really. So this is kind of where this buffer corn comes from, actually a year before, but um, this had, uh, so some of the data you're modeling, you want to crypto, you, you want to have it be trustable to other people. So you can cryptographically sign it. You have these things called verifiable credentials. So this can pay a part in the, in a, I guess, a trusted knowledge graph. So you could present your skills to it other ways, kind of as a, not a, a digital form of your resume, but not, well, more advanced, I guess. The computer you could do a little bit more of the heavy lifting. It's less dumb, I guess. Um, so that's where that came from. And I learned a little bit about account abstraction. I was just really cool with it. But it was a cool buffer corn from there. Um, so then I, then I went to Casual Island. So that has to do with, um, I guess, the disparateness of, of, of data. Like, whenever you build a distributed system, it's always limited by the speed of light, really. Um, that's what Brooklyn Zalenka got into. So you, you have these disparate pieces. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Um, right, right. So you have these just pieces of data everywhere. But I mean, fortunately, the data you most use probably could be aggregated locally and also in your local communities. So this goes back to the maker spaces. You could do local production with that, local collaboration. And you have these long tails and you work with other people to do that. Um, so I was interested in kind of how to implement that. And that's why I went to Toronto. Um, for casual islands. And then I have another thing, and this is really about reforming the educational system. So I went to this event in New York, and this went to a Let Me Think workshop, and this spawned me to ultimately to Montreal for the Value Flow Networks to model the retribution, so an open source way to how do you get paid. And, uh, and then it eventually led me to California for the identity workshop. I've been there multiple times, but um, you have to, that's not, uh, it's not really like the cryptographically verifiable data, but it's everything. <laughs> and hey. You're good, um, man, you're good. I won't let you keep them, but I want you to hold them. Um, say that again? Okay. Is this your buddy? Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm going to put him right there. That's awesome. All righty. I'm telling you, this is, this is a lot more fun than it probably looks this, being this strict. Okay, we got one more talk before our break. Uh, we'll talk about just the break after this talk there. But yeah, let's go ahead and have Adrian Townsend come up. He's one of my coworkers, which also means one of Eric's coworkers, since we all work at Clever together. But next fun fact, also about the OKC Web Does logo. Again, I know you can't see it right now, but if you have seen it, you'll notice there, there's hexagons in the logo that kind of have OKC in it. Um, those are based off of, I'm not a chemistry expert by any means, but I think those are, in, if you like diagram things out, they're called skeletal formula. Um, they're like little carbon chains there. Um, nothing related to like the actual like chemistry behind it, but that's a reference to the field that we're in development, like being a science. So it's like, you know, true to its name, we want to make sure that we're represented as a computer science. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people will get into development and kind of not think about that side of it, but we want to make sure that we're always shown as that. So that's kind of where some of the inspiration goes to there. All right, communication. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Adrian. I work at Clever as the product design lead, as well as a uh, co-organizer of the design tech uh, user group, part of Techlahoma. Uh, today I wanted to talk about connecting through communication. So the ability to communicate effectively is the key to success for ourselves, the experience of our users, the visions of our clients, and the collaborative spirit of our team. So I'd like to share a few tips about how to connect through communication. So the first one here is connect, uh, communication with the user. 
Provide immediate and informative feedback to the users when they interact with your design. So that means letting them know when actions are, are successful or if there are errors and, and how to resolve those. Uh, another way is consistency. So maintain consistent design language throughout your product or interface. Consistency in layout, typography, colors, interactions, help users feel more comfortable and confident. Uh, clarify. So this means to use clear and concise language, visual elements, and navigation to make it easy for the users to understand your design. So avoid ambiguity and confusion. Accessibility is also really important. Make sure your design is inclusive by following accessibility guidelines to accommodate users with disabilities, such as uh, having considerations for text alternatives, keyboard navigation, and more. Uh, okay. So another part of communication is with the client. So the first one here is understanding the client. So actively listen to your client, understand their needs, expectations, and concerns, and this will help to tailor your communication to their specific requirements. Um, identify the problem. Sometimes the why isn't so clearly outlined, so an important thing to do is ask questions and engage in dialogue to help clarify misunderstandings. If issues arise, work collaboratively with the client to find solutions. Be proactive in addressing pro problems and providing alternatives. Uh, communicate solutions. So effectively communicate your thought process and how your designs work to achieve the needs of the client as well as their users. And this is really important to explain how data is used to help with your decision making. And this will help uh, generally with um, getting your point across of why you do, the why you made the decisions you made. Another one is clarity. Communicate clearly and professionally avoiding overly technical language that the client may not understand. So be concise and to the point. Uh, regular updates, maintain open and transparent communication throughout the project, provide regular updates on progress, milestones, and any other issues that may arise. Uh, also take notes, like written or mental notes about your design decisions in order to effect effectively communicate them. Um, helpful tools, this is important for showing or visualizing ideas that may be hard to communicate otherwise. Set boundaries, clearly define your working hours, communication channels, and response times. This helps manage the client expectations and prevent burnout. Have confidence. Have confidence in what you're saying. Talk about your ideas with enthusiasm, but also be willing to hear feedback. Uh, and also follow up. So the pro once the project is completed, follow up with the client to ensure that they are satisfied and inquire about potential future collaborations. Last part here is collaboration or communication with your team. So, Part of that is collaboration. Um, this leads to a better product overall. You'll gain insight from the, uh, that you may not have considered before. So listen and be willing to work together. Schedule re regular team meetings to discuss products, our progress, updates, and address any concerns. This helps keep everyone on the same page and fosters a sense of unity. Constructive criticism, this is also really important. So when offering feedback or addressing issues, focus on constructive criticism, Fra frame your feedback, in a way that promotes learning and improvement rather than blaming. Uh, compromise, there will always be differences in opinions. Find a middle ground and be willing to make adjustments or sacrifices to help achieve a resolution that is acceptable for everyone. Be approachable, make yourself approachable and available for team members to discuss concerns or ask for guidance. Create an environment where team members feel comfortable asking questions and providing feedback. Uh, also, recognize individual strengths, so acknowledge and leverage the strengths of each team member. Recognizing individual contributions fosters the sense of value and motivation. Be an active listener, hear and understand feedback and concerns. This means truly understanding and considering others' perspectives before responding. And last one here, celebrate achievements. Acknowledge this celeb and celebrate team achievements with both, both big and small. This boosts morale and reinforces a positive team culture. That's it. Thank you. All right, and we're back. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed the break. Great first half. Thanks to all the first half speakers. Uh, I'm going to do a quick shameless plug for Tulsa Web Devs. As Aaron mentioned, uh, just like he runs OKC Web Devs with some help, I run Tulsa Web Devs with some help. And Alec, who talked about how to not hate converting JavaScript to TypeScript if you're not a TypeScript person uh, earlier, is my co-organizer currently. And we've added two more to the mix, Niall Dixon and Crystal Tipton Carrillo, and we're very excited about where that's all headed next year. Uh, and uh, we've 
got some stuff coming up. So uh, much like uh, Aaron's previous slide, I may or may not have copied his format um, in his own slides. So there you go. Uh, you can join us in the Slack as well. We have a very similar channel, UG Tulsa Web Devs, and we are on Meetup at meetup.com slash Tulsa Web Devs. That is where all of our general Meetup information goes. Uh, our next one is Hack Night, the Hacksgiving edition. That is turkey laptop ninja emoji, if you can't see it from the back of the room. It's very important. Uh, so that's going to be a security-themed event. We're all going to learn how to be our best uh, you know, Nmap users, basically. Um, and uh, so that's Tuesday, the week after the OKC Widows event on the 28th, and that'll be in Tulsa for any of our Tulsa people uh, at the 36 North Base Camp. There will be food and stickers. Notice we give out stickers. They brought them here, though, so I can't really talk because we didn't have any here. So uh, much love for the user groups. So that's what we got going on there. Ta-da, that's magic. Okay, great. Um, so uh, up next, we have Shanda Biggs telling us not to trust the robots. <laughs> I, my university students used to accuse me of being a robot, so I'm a little scared about where this is headed, but I'm going to go sit on that cowbell now, so. Oh, right. <laughs> oh i got to skip you to your slides. I screwed up. Aaron gave me one thing to do, and I only had one job, and I messed it up, so here we are. How do you do the, the not full screen on your machine? Oh, I was just hitting escape. But. Exit full screen. This one be you. Back to full screen. There you go. Thank you. There we go. Okay. A few things I've learned while obsessing about AI. I know I'm going to talk about AI, so please don't leave. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm uh, Shana Biggs, the Director of Web Development at Ghost Agency here in Oklahoma City. Um, so we, at our office, we, when ChatGPT and all of that hype came out, we decided to um, start dedicating an hour a week um, on how we can incorporate AI into our dev workflow to help speed up the development process. Um, and a lot of people get really overwhelmed when uh, they think about how to use AI because a lot of people are talking about it, they don't know where to start, what tools to use, where to learn about it. Um, I personally listen to a podcast, um, This Day in AI, on my one day a week that I go to the office. Um, so I listen to it on the way to and from work. Um, but there's all kinds of cool stuff out there. Free Code Camp has a ton of really cool projects that you can look at and explore and find cool things to do. Um, uh, so please take my job, AI. I don't really mean that, but I'm, I'm, one, I'm just kind of curious. How many people in here uh, use like GitHub Copilot or some sort of like AI assisted coding tool? Yeah, like a, a lot of people, right? Um, GitHub did a survey and they found that uh, they surveyed 500 US developers, 96, or wait, 92, sorry. 92% <laughs> of them are using some sort of AI tool for their, for their job, which is, really incredible, but if, if you're able to use it, you find that it helps you develop faster and you're able to spend more time doing the things that help you do your job really well, which is collaborate, refactor, things like that. Um, so here are some of the tools that are commonly used. GitHub Copilot, I think, is probably the most common one. Um, ChatGPT, Tab9. My personal favorite is something that I've used fairly recently and it's pretty new. It's called Pieces App. Um, then there's also design tools, Midjourney, um, Figma plugins, and Adobe actually just released a lot of really cool new AI features that you should check out if you're a designer. Okay, so I want to talk about Pieces then. Uh, Pieces is a, a contextual AI app that it has, was built with the developer's workflow in mind, um, which is what makes it so awesome. So as a developer, you know that you kind of like half remember things and then half go out and search and figure out how to do it and bring that into your code. And um, what Pieces does is that you're able to um, save snippets and it will, um, it, it recognizes your project and your code and it will give you recommendations as you're coding uh, based on what you're working on. So it will also like add tags to snippets that you save um, it adds a title automatically. Uh, it's another cool feature is that it adds relevant links to your snippets. Um, so um, you can go out and search right within your IDE. All of this 
is happening inside your IDE when you're using it. So all of the JetBrain IDEs, um, it's available on us on available on Visual Studio Code. There's um, a Teams extension. <laughs> Um, and you can add it to Chrome. You can, uh, there's Obsidian. If, it, if you use a particular ID and it's not available, definitely message them because they're, they're constantly building and improving this and they add new features like every week. And it's just like such a cool tool. Another so cool thing about it is that you can add it to your machine and it gives you the option to um, like download Llama 2 with it. Uh, and uh, completely run everything on your machine without connecting to the internet, which is so amazing. I, I, I know if you work for a corporation, a lot of them are like, I don't want you training AIs how to use our code base or whatever. Well, you can run all of this on your machine and it's all air gap saved on your machine, not shared elsewhere unless you want to, and you can choose where to share it with your team. I can't even go over all the features. It has so many amazing features. Um, one thing is that it records your workflow, so you can go back in your workflow and look to see where you were, um, like say at the end of the day, and you wanna get back into things. It, it always takes like a little bit of time before you're being productive. And you can go back and look at some of the things you did and, and you're able to start coding a lot faster because you kind of get in that flow of thinking um, what you were looking at, the articles and so on um, within your workflow. Uh, so how does it compare to some of the other AI coding tools that we use? Um, in GitHub Copilot, Tab 9, ChatGBT, all of that stuff you can't save other than what is it shows you automatically. Um, and you can't um, share it um, or reference it or reuse it. This has all of that stuff in it. And the very best part of it is that it's free. Um, so right now it's free. You can download it on your machine. And um, if you give them feedback, they say that they're going to try and grandfather in all of the free users But if they do decide to start charging. Um, Tab 9, I know, OpenAI, all of that, they have a monthly fee. So it's, it's a really cool tool. I hope you guys go check it out. <laughs> Oh. Do you want me to hand? Yeah, you can go ahead and give that to me. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks so much, Shanda. That was that was awesome. More cowbell for sure. Uh, next up, we're gonna bring John Yarbor, who, if uh, y'all saw earlier, there was a Nodecraft sponsor. That's Jonathan's company here. So major shout out there, sponsoring the company not only through that but Lightning Talks too. The last fun fact I want to give about OKC Web Dev, actually there's another one, I, I'm lying. And, but second to last fun fact is we've gone over the colors, we've gone over the, um, the science behind it. There's another thing too, you'll notice again, if you have seen the logo, it's like these boxes, it's those, those skeletal formula, right? That kind of represents like architecture, back end, like structure and what we do as developers. But then you'll notice there's like paint blobs as well that like go outside of those. And that really represents the creativity side of web development. So whether that's like, you want to think of that as more front end or like creative or design. It's like, you know, paint outside the lines, paint outside the blocks. So it's kind of a combination of we focus on architecture, but also you got to have fun. You got to like, you know, fit what you need to do to make your business models work. Um, okay, that's it. Let's let Jonathan Yarbor, let's, let's give him a big hand, round of applause and get this underway. Thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, I did not plan on giving a talk today. Um, I was voluntold. So, uh, uh, either way, so the story, uh, my, my title is called Storytime. It's kind of bait, uh, but also I'm a father now, so it's kind of dear to my heart these days. Um, but really what I want to talk about here is how many times have you gotten that moment where you ha you're given a task to do and you have to change something minor, but like, oh, it'll take you 20 minutes, right? Just move the button to the right and add one next to it. And you're like, that sounds really great. But then you start looking into it, and you're like, oh, on mobile, you know, it's a little different. It, it, it might be fixed, or, you know, uh, what happens if it's on an exotic device, like a gaming held, handheld, like we have here at Notecraft. Um, it, it becomes something where your, your small task is no longer small because you have to think about all the intricacies of that work. And one of the tools that we've, uh, or be back up for just a second here, if you're a gamer, you've seen this exact problem start taking shape as 
not only do those different changes start manifesting in different ways, but this is a product uh, called Steam, and these are all the different button types they have, for example. And so not only do you have problems with these changes being something that aren't quick and easy to do, but you're not really sure what your designs might look like. If only there was a tool that could help us tell a better story about our UIs. And so today I'm gonna to talk to you about first a product called Storybook. It's a way for you to visualize the UI components by focusing just on one UI component and then maybe later the way it's implemented in a view separate of your product so that this is not hydrated with the database. That means you don't have to go spin up a, a test database and the app just to go fix or change that button. You can just focus on implementing the change here and then reflect that by, I don't know if you use like an internal NPM module or sub modules in Git. It doesn't matter. That's not the part of what this does. This helps you focus on that. And so um, this is a internal example of a live storybook we have today. Um, usually we're in dark mode because we're gamers and we have to, of course, do everything, you know, with the lights off and dark mode, but I've changed it so it's a little more easy to see today. Um, this is a input box, which is like a number box you can go up or down, but again, like, that's what's obviously working. What about all this, those moments where you need to change things about your input or your UI that you're working on? Let's tell, to let's tell stories about these so that we can really explore those different parts of your UI. So for example, I can turn on the prop in my view, this is actually a view component, by the way, uh, that changes things like stepping. Now it doesn't increment by one, but by thousands, right? Or we can select a minimum or a maximum, like this is our power level, and unfortunately it doesn't go over 9,000. The reality is we have full control over our component that we built on the right-hand side. These are all props that are being put into my component. I can test them at any point or turn on or off things not only to play with them like live to make sure it's what my changes are happening aren't, are, are being well reflected, but also make sure that things like different UI uh, views, for example, like adding a range slider, or um, you know, if you're a gaming company, you have to like, actually bring graphics to your product, you can test those things all work well together. And so, um, real quick, um, the way this ends up working is you take your components, this works for React, Vue, Svelte, a lot of online front end frameworks, it doesn't really matter. The focus isn't on, for example, my view component you see here. The focus actually comes down to these stories that you write. You write a quick story that says, this is my number input. It has certain arguments that you pass into there. Sometimes it can read those dynamically from your components. It does really well with React, actually. Um, but it lets you really define and write out the, it's almost like writing a test, actually, with all these different stories that tells you, like, Again, like you saw earlier, this is a power level that steps by 1,000, and we've limited it to 899. But again, these are just defaults that help the story get told, which is especially helpful when you have a product manager who wants to come in and, and really understand how does that UI function. Um, and then when you like add that into your other UIs, you can start seeing how they start working to hand in hand um, to really uncover how your uh, UI functions as a whole. So for example, you can see the different variants of the story going on and on. So not only is this helpful, can you set test up inside this that'll actually dynamically be run um, in the app itself, but the really, really cool part is there's extra tools out there. Uh, for example, like story to design that helps you sync your storybook stories to Figma. So for example, I can go into Figma here and it becomes a, through some magic and some setup, it wasn't ma that, fast of magic, it took me like a week unfortunately. But you can add those components like that input slider. And I can even control, I know it's a tiny little input box over there, it's kind of hard to say, that was an awful blue choice. Uh, but it, you can see how I can make changes to the way that's presented just like I could in Storybook, which means that our product managers, our UI mockups, aren't just going to be these ugly like, eh, we'll make it work, but they actually reflect how your UI works. And so it becomes a situation where combined, you have a full end-to-end -end way to test your UI, see live reflections in your mockups, and keep your designers from running away. Um, thank you so much for coming. My name is, again, Jonathan Yarber. I'm Captain Yarber Online. Um, at the other day, I'm really kind of this engineer who cosplays as a CEO, so a little bit of both. But uh, please feel free to reach out to me online, and thank you very much. Next, we've got Mr. Rob Farley. Got Robin here while he's getting set up. 
And uh, while Rob's on his way up, I will go back to my uh, random fun facts. Today in 1885, German engineer Gottlieb Daimler unveiled the world's first motorcycle, question mark? Uh, I say question mark because you're all going to need to go Google a picture of this thing. Um, it was known as the Daimler Reitwagen, as any good German vehicle should be. Uh, when it was announced, it boasted a whopping half a horsepower and topped out at seven miles an hour. It is a fascinating looking steam powered bicycle looking thing. So go Google the Daimler Reitwagen, not now, because uh, we're about to listen to Rob. So with that, I'm going to, how are you doing up there, Rob? You just about ready? Oh yeah, perfect. All right, everybody, uh, my name is Rob Farley. I'm out of uh, Tulsa, where I attend a school called Holberton. Uh, I jumped in the tech world uh, for software dev about a year ago and still have about uh, nine months on my journey. Uh, I'm also part of the Tulsa Web Devs uh, with these guys and started attending just recently, but enjoying it ever since. Uh, my goal here was just to get up on stage and talk about something, uh, maybe for next year to talk about something more technical or something cool, like a, a, a tool or something like that. But today we're going to be talking about the joy of starting and the challenge of finishing projects, something that I think it can, everyone can relate to, from someone in HR to a new guy in software to someone who's been doing it for 30 years or so. So there's a few stages within this uh, process that we're all familiar with. The first one being the excitement of a new beginning. There's, you know, it's fresh. Everybody has imaginations on what this project could be, or it could be painting a, uh, a house. And so you're starting to think of all, all the colors you want to paint it, all the tools you could buy to help do that, or you could be looking at some tech stacks you're going to be using to build a project. So it's very exciting to see the beginning with all the possibilities that are kind of endless. Uh, your creative talking with each other on certain aspects of the project. You're coming together and collabing with experienced people or new people. But it's overall exciting because it's, you don't know where it's going to lead to exactly just yet. Uh, once you guys come together, you make a plan, and you know it's going to start igniting the passion of what that end product could be. So it allows uh, teams to explore new ideas and technologies, uh, if that's the goal of that project. Uh, it also allows motivation and pro uh, productivity within that company or team. Uh, and also it allows uh, professional growth as someone who may be just starting out or someone who's kind of stagnant in their, in their job field. Uh, you know, again, this is the beginning, so it's all super exciting. Uh, so something that's kind of going on with the beginning is you have all this motivation and inside of what you really want to do and it has a lot of momentum. It's something you might think about after you leave work or on the weekend or whatnot, but this part is kind of crucial because it can carry on the weight through the rest of that project. Uh, it's gonna create a positive atmosphere, so coming together, game planning of how you wanna tackle this project, either storyboarding, coming up with rough designs. Uh, there's a lot of different you know, techniques to the beginning of this pro a process. Uh, it also is going to set the tone for the rest of the project that you guys are trying to attend. Uh, so that's coming together, weekly meetings, uh, just kind of seeing what you guys want to do. And then the second phase of everyone's project, and hopefully you maybe reach this point, is the mid-project slump. So this is uh, where you start to reach burnout. You've already got a ton of hurdles that you've maybe accomplished and you come to a point where you're just over the project. It's maybe not something you want or expected to do. It's technologies are not something that is favorable to your skill set, so you kind of get demotivated and maybe possibly even throw away the project. And one thing through this whole process that I kind of believe in for sure is starting projects, everyone's gonna do it. It's something that's fun and it's okay to fail. It's okay to start a thousand projects, but it, as long as you're sharing your projects and ideas with either loved ones or coworkers, maybe that might inspire them to finish a project or idea that you might have. Uh, so this part of the mid-project slump is going to be a lot of, a lot, everyone's going to go through it at some point or, have, or has done it a ton of times, but definitely we want to come together and like reemphasize maybe what the end goal is of your projects. 
uh, maybe this is to come together as a team and like we have to pivot to what that end project could be. So instead of maybe painting the house, we're gonna paint the house and also a couple rooms. And that leads to more and more tasks that you guys might have to do to finish that project. But it's still a project that you're wanting to maybe finish. Uh, another key point in this one is gonna be re-energizing your team. So that initial motivation is starting to wear off at this point and the excitement of the imagination is died off. Uh, this is where maybe a project manager or someone who's experienced is gonna come together. Hey, let's refocus on our goals, our, uh, our end product of what we wanna really see and you definitely gotta bring that motivation back. Uh, so some of the, oh man, okay, uh, that went quick. So uh, some challenges we got in there is, you know, scope creep, that tends to happen once you start maybe distrusting your team or you start to uh, anticipate a lot more challenges within your, your project. Uh, some strategies, you know, communicating effectively with stakeholders, uh, you know, establishing clear project goals on where you want to really see that project to be done. Uh, but so why finishing can be daunting. That lack of motivation, the burnout, technical issues, unexpected obstacles, uh, like I said, pivoting a lot, uh, and quality assurance and testing requires meticulous attention to detail. Uh, so the art of finishing what you started. Many projects fail to reach completion due to lack of planning and clear goals, realistic deadlines, and procrastination. So embrace the journey, and uh, my last thing is a call to action, share your ideas with everybody, and don't be afraid to start projects and share that with everybody. Again, my name is Rob Farley. All right. Oh, you got, the, you got it a minute ago. Well, we'll, we'll see. Next speakers, we'll see. Okay, awesome talk there by Rob. Um, and thanks for coming down from Tulsa, too. It's, we, we love that it's not just like OKC, Lahoma with these kind of conferences. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, next up, we got Vance. I see you back there. Come on up. So um, while Vance is going up, I'm going to give you our, the last OKC Web Devs little fun fact that I'm going to give. And this is that our first meetup, OKC Web Devs, was technically February of 2020. It was like the most fun, you know, month before everything went, went down. So that was a fun time to create a new user group. But actually, if you really think about it, we're much older than that. Um, that was the first official meetup we had. But what OKC Web Devs really is, is it was a combination of three other user groups that just kind of wanted to merge together. That was OKC Ruby, OKC Python, and OKC JS, which all of those honestly had existed before Techlahoma, especially OKCJS has been around since 2011 or something. That's probably those, the, the user groups that Vance was talking about early on. So we're old. Even if, even if our name and our logo are relatively new, like we're all based on you know, stuff that's, that's been pretty old. So, and there we go. All right, everyone, let's raise the roof for Vance Lucas. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I told Aaron to sign me up if he didn't get enough sign up. So the fact that I'm up here means not enough of y'all signed up. So now you have to listen to a sales pitch. OK, so uh, this is my product budget sheet. It connects uh, <laughs> Google Sheets to uh, bank transactions. So you can import bank transactions into Google Sheets in an automated manner. Why spreadsheets? Um, because I like them. Um, software companies seem to hate spreadsheets. A lot of marketing seems targeted at how much spreadsheets suck, right? So, um, oh. Yeah, that one's not loading, but um, everyone's talking about like how to replace spreadsheets. Uh, this is a spreadsheet killer. How our app is better than a spreadsheet. Um, are you still using spreadsheets, you old curmudgeon? You know, let go of the let go of them. Um, <laughs> you know, why you should use an app for this and not a spreadsheet? Because spreadsheets are messy and whatever. Um, all this, all this kind of stuff, right? So some of these images aren't loading, but um, uh, you kind of get the idea, like. That's kind of marketing, but users like really love spreadsheets. Uh, I really love spreadsheets. Uh, are there any spreadsheet nerds in here? Because anyone loves spreadsheets? OK. See, there's a lot. Like, that's probably 20% of the room, at least. Maybe 30. Um, spreadsheets are flexible. They're, they're uh, the unlimited power. You can do any, whatever you want with your own data. They're pretty cool. So what if, instead, a financial product leaned into spreadsheets and just made it easier to mess with your data in a spreadsheet? Um, I started off by doing the smallest, simplest thing possible, just automate the data fetching, automate the account linking, automate the data fetching, formatting, categorization, whatever, 
get it in the spreadsheet. Um, and I'm a programmer, I'm not a marketer or salesperson uh, by default. <coughs> um, so I need help and leverage with marketing. So uh, I need a place that has a, um, a, like a marketplace. So I found Google Apps Script and I got pretty deep in Google Apps Script. It's really just JavaScript with APIs. So that's what you can think of. Uh, there's global APIs to modify anything you want. Spreadsheets, email, docs, whatever. Um, very robust thing. Um, Google Workspace Marketplace also lists your add-on. So if you make an add-on for a Google product, uh, spreadsheet, doc, power, uh, you know, slides, uh, mail add-on, you can put it in Google Workspace Marketplace. So free distribution, built-in distribution. Uh, it's a uh, developer's dream. So where those extensions end up, there's an extensions menu when you're using these products, and it's like a menu item. So this is, this is the UI of Budget Sheet right here. This is how you get into it. And then this is the entire UI of Budget Sheet, everything that users see. So my entire product is in 300 pixels. Uh, and uh, it's doing very well. So how's it going? I've been working on it a little bit over three years. Um, I've got 8,000 plus total users. Um, I don't have a permanent free user, so this is like transient users in snapshots of time that have installed the product over the three years. I have 500, uh, more than 500 active paying users, uh, about 3.5K MRR. Um, it's growing two X, uh, over 2X a year from 300 pixels, so pretty, uh, pretty decent for a side project. Um, Build a painkiller, not a vitamin. This is, this is a super easy thing to say, hey, get my data in a spreadsheet. Does it automatically, does it easily? Um, have a fast elevator pitch that's easy to understand. Mine is like your bank data in a spreadsheet, automated, like simple. Everyone understands what that is instantly. Um, there are riches in the niches. So this is, you know, not everyone wants, not everyone likes to uh, work in spreadsheets. Like this is a product that you either uh, like or you, you hate, you know? You're like, no, I don't want to use a spreadsheet. I don't want to use a full service like budgeting app with a mobile app and everything else. Or you're like, hey, spreadsheet actually sounds pretty cool. So um, instant audience. Um, don't sleep on marketplaces. Give you a lot of leverage. Really help with marketing, uh, especially if you're not good at marketing by default. Like if you're a developer your whole life like me um, that really needs some help. Um, <laughs> do marketing. <laughs> this is a hard one for a lot of developers, right? Um, I've done more marketing probably in the past, I don't know, year especially. Than, I, than I've ever done. Uh, finding a way to send automated emails from the system, um, finding a way to, to do upsells, add, add emails for when people's trial is expiring to let them know, offer upgrades, um, product updates, how to send those updates out to the list of users, all that kind of stuff I've done. Um, advertising in various places and, and everything else. And uh, that's my product, budgetsheet.com. Check it out, thanks. ago and decided it was more pain than it was worth, so I might just buy yours, so thank you for that. Perfect. I'm coming to get one of those on my way out. That was an excellent placement for a pitch there, Vance, so thank you. Uh, all right, up next we've got Fazil, so if you want to come up and get set up here uh, while I share some more, you know, good segue material. This one I was very excited to learn and also a little horrified by. If you did not know already, Giraffes are 30 times more likely to get hit by lightning than people. <laughs> True, there are only five well-documented lightning strikes on giraffes between 1996 and 2010, but since their population of the species is only about 140,000, that makes them roughly 30 times as likely as humans to get struck by lightning. So as a tall person, I am in here feeling for the giraffes at the moment. <laughs> So that's that. I would also just say like uh, Tulsa Web Devs also has like a great pedigree. I just feel like we need to own up to a little bit in the way that Aaron did as well. It was also an amalgam of a bunch of previous Tulsa Python groups and other things that like came together. So just a little shout out for standing on the shoulders of people that came before you. All right, Fazil, you set them ready to go? Yeah. All righty, man, the floor is yours. All right, everyone. Um, my name is Fazal Raja, and I'll be giving a talk about hackathons. Uh, first off, who am I? Well, I'm a current computer science master student at OU. Um, I'll be graduating this December. And fun fact about me: for some reason, animals tend to love me more than others. 
especially in my family. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on over there. But why me giving this talk? Well, I was the ex-operations director for Hacklahoma. Um, Hacklahoma is the hackathon at OU. I'll talk about that. Um, well, why am I giving this talk? Well, there's some random talk going on in the Slack channel about hackathons and how there's a lack of hackathons in OKC. And I volunteered to help. Um, so here I am. Um, I attended organized hackathons, at, um, especially at OU. And the first hackathon I attended, it won the best theme. All I'm going to say, the theme was um, community, and the next day was Valentine's Day. That's all I'm saying. I'm not really proud about that. But uh, what is a hackathon? So does, there's that fancy quote. You guys can go ahead and read that. I'm not about all that technical terms and all that. But basically, you come together as a community to innovate, network, and create cool stuff at the end of the day. So it's a really exciting event that goes on. Um, so, Hacklahoma, I talked about Hacklahoma, is OU's hackathon is probably the largest hackathon in Oklahoma. Um, the only thing is, it's students only, so as professional developers, it's kind of hard to attend it, that hackathon. Uh, we do have Techlahoma staff going in to mentor and volunteer, especially Luigi over here. Shout out, Luigi. Um, so, um, you can be a boot camp student as well, and we have 200 students plus. Um, here are some pictures over here, and as you can see, we have multiple workshops going on and multiple sponsors, notably like Paycom, Northrop Gunman, Boeing, and Coke. Um, we have a bunch of sponsors coming in, and they recruit and network. And then, I don't know. Um, so why create Oklathon? So this is just a random name I came up. Oklathon is Oklahoma's hackathon that I guess we're planning. Well, first off, there aren't any really Oklahoma community-led hackathons at all. Um, if anything, um, there are community hackathons or student hackathons at, at colleges or remote hackathons that are in person. Um, so Oklathon, it will be inclusive. Anybody can fight for the prize. It can be a middle school student attending his computer science class or a um, professional developer or a uni student or a boot camp student. Anybody can join and fight for the prizes at the end of the day. Um, so hackathons have general themes and problems, but they mostly do not restrict um, hackers to specific um, projects. As I said, um, when the last theme for Hacklahoma was space, and we have a bunch of a bunch of projects ranging from like healthcare to space to cars, etc., um, to microwaves as well. So they allow creative freedom for hackers to innovate and develop, and it fosters a strong community and educates them. So the best way to learn is by doing something, and hackathons is what embodies that. You go in and you do stuff, and that's how you learn. Um, next thing is that it drives innovation and creativity. So yes, they do have general themes and products, but like as I said, they're not restricted. They can do whatever they want. Um, and with that, you can innovate, and hackers can express themselves and introduce their perspectives and problem-solving skills and thoughts. Um, one of the most important things as engineers and developers is a growth mindset. As you know, technology is always ever evolving and you want to be able to learn on the go. And hackathons encourage that. You always want to have a growth mindset as a developer. And then one thing that's really important as a community is to have social impact. Um, hackathons push hackers past the limits and allows them to grow beyond what they think they can achieve. Um, every single hackathon that's successfully done allows people to come together, create, innovate, and solve problems as a society. Um, it can be in health tech, ed tech, remote work productivity. Um, it can be whatever you need. But last but not least, they are fun. Um, I had a couple of people I talked of here. They attend hackathons. They did their own hackathon um, at their companies. And it's a really fun thing to do. And it's a great thing for the community to come, to come together and build some stuff. Um, so if you're interested in, in building Oklathon, as I said, this is a random name I came up yes, or was it today at 2 a.m. while creating these slides? So it is subject to change. If you guys have any thoughts about this, um, there's that QR code, or you can just search up hackathons in the Slack, Techlahoma Slack, and join that channel. Um, to get this up and running, we do need volunteers and organizers, such as tech folks to create the website, uh, marketing um, for the graphics and stuff. We need sponsors to get this off the ground and up and running. Money is the most important thing. I'm telling this first off. And the operations such as food, event halls, etc. So yeah, go ahead and join the Slack channel and let us know your thoughts. Thank you.
All right. Awesome job, Fazel. That was, that was awesome. Um, okay. So next up, we've got Turner Bass or Turner Bass. Do we have Turner here? Okay, Bass. There we go. All right. So while he's getting all set up there, uh, I got one last fun fact. It's not about OKC Web Devs. Uh, has anyone here seen the movie Cars, like the Disney movie from like 2007? So I hadn't really seen it until we had our son, uh, and it's, pr it's a pretty root and toot and awesome movie. I really like it. Um, so a lot of the premise is based off of like Route 66. You probably gathered that if you've seen it, like about this from promoting it and everything. Well, Route 66 uh, goes through Oklahoma. That's kind of why I'm getting at this. But it turns, uh, um, oh, you don't have slides. You're probably already ready. OK, let me wrap this up quick. Uh, Route 66 okay, was founded in, in 1916, which means it's turning 100 in 2026. And between, it goes like from Chicago. The original one goes from Chicago to like LA. It's not fully intact anymore. But um, it, you know, the original one kind of went through Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Um, so to celebrate the 100th, year, 100th anniversary of it, uh, in November of 2026, so quite, quite, quite a ways away, uh, a lot of Oklahoma cities have teamed up to celebrate like 100 miles of Christmas, like with Route 66. So that's like there's like 10 big cities between there, like Stroud, of course, Oklahoma City, but like Arcadia, Tulsa, Sepulpa. Um, if you drive through there during that time, like the actual original highway, um, then they're supposed to have a lot of fun Christmas lights in there, just kind of Christmas activities. So we're obviously like three years in advance, so I'm sure it's going to get even more awesome in there. But if that sounds fun, uh, just Google that up because you have a lot of time to prepare. Um, okay, that said, let's give it up for Turner Bass. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, as he said, I'm Turner Bass um, from Astro Panda Studios, and we're based out of Shawnee, Oklahoma. Um, so it was just a little bit of a drive to get here this morning, but not too bad. Um, you'll have to forgive me. This is a little on the fly, so I'm just speaking from my experience here. And so um, just uh, forewarning you that this is going to be a whirlwind, whirlwind advocacy for GraphQL and also hot chocolate. Um, I come from the .NET space. I've been a .NET developer for a little over 11 years, sorry, 10 years, almost 11 years. Um, I promise I can count. And um, <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, um, Astro Panda had a client where we were given the unique challenge of making things work better for this client and making a single source of truth while replacing nearly 80 desktop applications, uh, 80 unique desktop applications that were editing data directly. Um, in my experience, I was very comfortable with working with RESTful APIs, and so I was like, here's what we need to do. We are establishing a single source of truth with a RESTful API, and so our first approach was to use OData for querying, and then um, you know, construct our routes for post and put when we're creating and updating. And then on the front end, we would use Blazor. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with Blazor, that is a .NET. Um, single page application framework. Um, I'm a little biased, but it's phenomenal. You should definitely try it if you haven't yet. Um, and so we were .NET back end, .NET front end, um, but as we're trying to make our client communicate with this, um, for just one application, this, the client to communicate with the server, it became very difficult to keep up with the sprawling amount of endpoints that we were having to maintain and to make sure that we're enforcing the structure of how those routes get constructed as you're making a certain functionality on the server um, and making sure that that makes it to the client as well. And I know there are things like Swagger um, that really help, uh, but it's still got a little bit out of hand, especially as we started adding other applications that other certain areas of the business needed to use and it didn't fit into one. So um, it, was, it was getting to be a lot on our team. Um, and we were having more requests for like live updates of data to just be on every client when things would happen. And so we were using Signal R for that, which is also a .NET library um, for getting WebSocket connections from a client to the server. So that kind of server side pushing of information can get to the client. Um, and that had its own route on top of all of the other RESTful routes. And we were starting to see this is way out of hand. We need to 
figure something out. Well, it was .NET Conf a couple of years ago that we had first heard about hot chocolate, um, which was created by a team out of Sweden called Chili Cream. And uh, they have the coolest names. I, they're, they're just a lot of fun. Hot chocolate is a server-side framework for taking just .NET objects and turning it into a GraphQL schema. And it just generates it for you when you start up the application. And so we're like, yes, that is great. Let's start working with that. Let's figure out how we're going to get the client to communicate with this. And then we learned that they had made Strawberry Shake, which is the client side of that equation that can take the schema from GraphQL and generate a strongly typed client on the fly. And so now we no longer had to keep up with routing. We no longer had to keep up with things like that. We could just focus on the functionality of our features and not where they lived because it was all coming from one place. And so we were working on, um, it was like seven different projects that were together through a gateway and we were able to take everything we had in REST and recreate it in GraphQL in two days. Um, and after that we were like, why didn't we do this before? This is like night and day difference and so now we can just focus on what is happening. And I know we're getting close to time, but some of the benefits of taking an approach with GraphQL is it already has that kind of client-side WebSocket subscription baked in. You can read, you can page, you can sort. All of that translates directly into your database provider through hot chocolate. And you have expressive mutations that change data. You no longer have to figure out, does this route actually mean X thing? Because it's right in the schema. And the subscriptions are already baked in. So you have one endpoint for reading, writing, and getting live updates. Yeah, thank you. Love me some GraphQL. Uh, up next and certainly not last, uh, but last anyway, um, or not least, I suppose we should say, would be the proper idiom there. Uh, this is why I'm not usually a speaker. Uh, uh, we've got Alex Rivieri, who gave us a great talk earlier today, uh, doing a lovely prance up to the stage, appreciate that, who's going to tell us how we're all learning currying wrong. I'm very excited about this because I both enjoy eating curry and uh, implementing it, um, but I've apparently been doing it wrong. So uh, let's give it up here for Alex. Okay, so today I want to talk to you about curry, but not this kind of curry. I actually want to talk to you about this curry. This curry, his full name is actually Haskell Curry. Anybody heard of the name Haskell before? Anybody? Anybody in the room? Yeah, I got a couple of hands there. Yeah, nerds. Um, so uh, Haskell Curry is, curry is a uh, mathematician from the early uh, 20th century. And he developed a thing called the currying function. And the currying function is a specific thing in math where you can specify how you do stuff. Uh, I'm Alex Revere. We're going to talk about JavaScript currying and how you are teaching it wrong slash how you are learning it wrong. Um, so what is currying? This is a 15 minute talk that I'm having to compress into like five minutes, so that's why I'm rushing through this. Um, currying is uh, where you can say, uh, you know, instead of doing x equals a function with three arguments, you can specify a series of functions and then call them in sequence. This is a bunch of really advanced math stuff and me with my high school diploma do not understand this, I have tried. So if you need a better explanation about this, go find a math major. Um, now, within JavaScript, currying functions are essentially just scope closures, which is a fancy way of saying you're making a function inside of another function. And 
Uh, an example of this that you typically see when someone is talking about currying functions is you have this function here, you have a thing called like add three, right? And it takes in an argument and then you have another function that it returns, it takes in an argument, you have another function that it returns, it takes in an argument, and then it ends up adding A, B, and C together, right? And so when you call it, you call it doing parentheses, 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 and then like all of the arguments, right? And it returns the number six when you do one, two, three. There we go, right? Great example, right? This is, this is how everybody shows off currying. They're like, yeah, this is a great great example of currying. Guess what? This is a terrible example of currying. You should never do that in a code base. You should never call a function like that. What are you doing? Um, so this is, if this is a bad uh, currying function example, what is a good currying function example, right? Like how, what, what does good curry look like? So um, what currying really is, is that it's sort of two things put together in like programming terms. What we really have here is that we have a factory method, which is a way of sort of creating like a, a thing that you want to like reproduce multiple of, right? Like it's creating a pattern for a thing and then you get to reproduce it. And then we have closures, which is basically specifying like stuff inside of something else and then you don't have access to that something else but you can use it still like within the thing. It's great. Closures are great. If you don't like closures, eh. Uh, anyway, uh, so let's talk about a real world example of using a currying function that you have probably used and didn't realize it. Um, so we're gonna make a fetch handler that has authentication and you can specify your URL, your URL routes. Sorry, I know that you just like gave a great talk about GraphQL and everything like that, but we're gonna go back into like REST API stuff. All right, so we start off by having a function and it takes in our authorization token, right? And then so that function returns another function that is going to take in the URL that we wanna to go to. And then that one is going to return a function that takes in all the options for our actual fetch call. And then it adds in our auth header to the header stuff. And uh, because that's where we got it, we got from the uh, first function call up there, and then it returns the actual fetch call with our URL, which we got from this function here, and uh, once it does all of this stuff, it sort of like returns all of that, and we end up getting uh, a fetch handler that we can use and then call and we get stuff from an API endpoint, great, right? Super clear, I'm sure everybody here perfectly understood every single part of that. I don't have to explain anything, right? You've got it all, we're good to go. Okay, cool. Um, let's talk about how to actually use that. So we're gonna import our uh, auth fetch stuff factory that we just made from our library. Um, we're going to have our very secret token that we are using to call the API with. We're going to have the endpoint that we wanna call, right? And then we're gonna have, um, we're just gonna do, you know, call auth fetch stuff factory token endpoint uh, and then call fetch and we get our stuff, right? This is a great example. Yay, right, this is a great example. No, this is a terrible example. This is the exact same example I showed you like two minutes ago. It's just got a different coat of paint on it. All right, let's talk about how we actually use this, right? So the way that we actually want to use this is that we're going to import our off fetch stuff thing from our library, right? This is our factory that makes, that starts the whole thing. We're gonna have another function that comes from somewhere that gets us, gets us the token that we need to be able to do things. We're going to create a factory for our off fetch. Thank you. Um, and it is going to uh, take in our token. We're then gonna create a couple of other functions. One is going to be fetch users, one is going to be fetch reports. And then once we have all of this in another file, we can import fetch users and then await fetch users. And now we have a function that does all of the stuff for us and it returns the stuff that we need and it is specific to just that endpoint. This is a good example. So currying functions, don't use them for everything. Do use them when you need to reuse some code. And remember kids, it's only a currying function if it is from the currying region of mathematics, otherwise it is just a spicy closure. Uh, that is my talk. Thank you very much. I want to see a 15 minute version of that. <laughs> There's actually a link to the video there, so you can. <laughs> did it. We made this happen. Cowbells, all of that. Next next time we might get like the, there's been jokes about getting like that, that cane, the vaudeville stick, is that, that what it's called? Yanking people off, we won't do that, but it's a fun joke. All right, we'll close this off with just some very last minute short announcements, and then you all have leveled up and completed the Thunder Plains conference.
obligatory, hopeful silence. Okay, so thank you all for attending Lightning Talks again. We aim to be done at 4.30. We're 4.27. This, this went off without a hitch, honestly. So thank you to all of our speakers for dealing with our shenanigans. Uh, it was very fun for us. We hope it was fun for you, too. Thank you again also to our speakers for like signing up the day of, signing up in advance, just making this happen. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of stuff and, and organization and everything to make this happen, and this, was, this went really well. We, we were really happy with this. Uh, okay, this is our full schedule. We are done. You're going to want to pay attention to that 5.30 after party with OKC Tech++. A couple hours ago, I wrongly said the after party was at The Verge. It is not there. I'm going to show you where it is on this next slide. Uh, it's in combination with this OKC Tech++ event, which happens periodically in the city. But it's at Dunlap Cotting, which is in a general vicinity close to where The Verge is, uh, but in like the downtown-ish area, uh, film row around there. But just know that, not at The Verge. The Verge is sponsoring the after party. That's, that's so powered by The Verge there. So just know that starts at 5.30, so you've got, you know, time till there to get there and everything, 5.30 to 8. And then... Uh, now the last thing I'll mention, again, just shout out to our, all the volunteers for all this, all the attendees for attending. This, this is such a fun conference every year, and this has been a blast. Last thing, uh, there is a prize drawing for a membership at 36 Degrees North, which is the headquarters of Techlahoma. It's the, you know, the big co-working space up in the Tulsa area. Uh, so if you want that, get out in the hallway, like now, after I finish this in like 10 seconds and see if you get that prize drawing. So that's it. Thanks again. I'm just going to give one last final applause for our second half speakers. This was, a, this was a blast. So thanks, everyone, for, for coming to this whole session. You are good to go.